Okay, then here we are in question one of this paper. We want to solve this uh, modulus equation here. And I think the best thing for us to do is to start by rearranging it so we just get the modulus on one side. So I'm going to do that by subtracting 5. So I get 2 times by the modulus of 8 minus 4x is equal to 20. Then I'm going to divide both sides by 2. So I get 8 minus 4x is equal to 10. And then uh, really what I've got to do, uh, there are two ways I could either square both sides or I could use the definition of the modulus. I think I'm going to use the definition of the modulus first. So let me just try to explain that. What does the modulus do? Um, if the value inside the modulus is positive, then there's no change. So we can think about it, that this way. Let's say we had the modulus of positive 3. What would that give us? That would give us 3, right? Because the value inside here is already a positive, and so the modulus um, doesn't change it. But let's say instead we had the modulus of negative 5. Um, what the modulus would do then is it would turn that into a positive number. So we could get positive 5. Now let's think um, a little bit more carefully. How could it turn a negative into a positive? Well, what it could do is it could multiply it by negative 1, right? Because if I take a negative number and I multiply it by negative 1, what happens is it gives me the corresponding positive number. So I think that's, that's a really helpful way for you to think about it, right? If the value inside is positive, there's no change, right? So the, the thing inside the modulus just stays the same. But if the thing inside the modulus is negative, then what happens is the modulus multiplies it by negative 1. So there are kind of two circumstances that we've got to consider. Circumstance 1 is if the 8 minus 4x is positive, right? If that's a positive number, then uh, the modulus isn't going to change it. So we're going to get 8 minus 4x is equal to 10. And we can rearrange that and get um, 4x is equal to negative 2. And so x is equal to negative 1 half. But we've also got another circumstance, which is if 8 minus 4x is negative. And um, if it's negative, what's going to happen is it's going to become a positive by multiplying through by negative 1. Right? So if this whole value, 8 minus 4x, is negative, if we multiply it by negative 1, it's going to become a positive number. So we're going to get this thing here. And uh, we can rewrite that as minus 8 plus 4x is equal to 10. So 4x is equal to 18, which means that x is equal to 18 divided by 4, or 9 upon 2. Okay? Um, now, a common error, by the way, I noticed with a lot of students, is they think that because a modulus turns negatives into positives, then what's going to happen is that that negative um, value there, the minus sign, just becomes positive. That's the wrong way to think about it, right? The, the way you want to think about it is the whole value of that thing, if it's negative, it will become a positive. And the way that's going to work is you take that whole value, 8 minus 4x, and you times it by negative 1. OK, then. Um, well, let's do it the other way. Let's do it by squaring both sides. So uh, we have the modulus of 8 minus 4x is equal to 10. And if we were to square both sides like that, then um, what, we're, what we're basically doing is we're dealing with, with the negative numbers, right? Because if we've got negative numbers and we square them, um, then what happens is all the negatives become positive. So in a way, um, squaring kind of imitates the, the function of the modulus in the sense that it deals with negative numbers. Okay, so if I uh, expand this, I'm going to get uh, 64 minus 64x six plus 16x squared is equal to 100. And that will give me 16x squared minus 64x minus 36. And I think I can divide that through by 4. So I get 4x squared minus uh, da, 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 uh, 16x uh, minus 9 is equal to 0. And that I will factorize, I think. That will factorize to give here negative 9 and positive 1, right? And the, the reason for that, right, negative 9 times by positive 1 gives you negative 9. That's the first thing. And if I've got negative 9 times by 2x, that's negative 18x. And then 2x times by positive 1 is positive 2x. So negative 18x plus 2x is negative 16x, which is that. And that's going to give us two values. That's going to give us x is equal to negative 1 half. And uh, x is equal to 9 upon 2, which is uh, the same thing as we had in the other way of doing the question, right? So two ways there. I hope both of those are helpful to you.
Okay then, so here we are in part B, we want to solve this inequality. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to deal with this fraction here first. Um, and actually I can notice that the entire right hand side is divisible by 3. So um, 59 divided by, uh, sorry, 57 divided by 3 is 19. 9x divided by 3 is 3x. And of course that's over 2. So get 16x minus 5x squared minus 3. And I can multiply both sides by 2. So I get 32x minus 10x squared minus 6 is less than 19 minus 3x. Okay, I'll bring everything through to the left-hand side. So negative 10x squared. I'm going to add 3x to both sides. So we get plus 35 x and I'll subtract 19 from both sides so I will get minus 25 and um, hopefully you can see that I should be able to divide both sides by 5 and I'll also divide through by negative 5 right to get rid of the negative number here and of course if I'm um, dividing through by a negative number or multiplying by a negative number then the sign of the inequality needs to flip so what we're going to get here is 2x squared minus 7x um, plus 5 is greater than 0. And uh, then what I'll do is I think I'll factorize this. So I'll get 2x there and an x here. Okay, now what I want is I want two numbers that are going to multiply together to give uh, positive 5 and that are going to combine in some way to give negative 7. Well, I think if I put a negative 1 here, and a negative 5 here, it's going to fit the bill because negative 5 times by negative 1 is positive 5. And um, what I'm going to get there is negative 5 times by x, which is negative 5x, and 2x times by negative 1, which is negative 2x, and negative 5x minus 2x is negative 7x. Now, a classic error at this point of the question is I see a lot of uh, students treating it like this is a quadratic equation and equality, and they'll say something like 2x minus 5 is greater than 0, and x minus 1 is greater than 0, and therefore x is greater than 5 upon 2, and x is greater than 1. In other words, they say that this thing must be greater than 0, and this thing must be greater than 0. That is the wrong way of looking at it. What I suggest you do to help your understanding is to quickly draw out a, uh, a graph of this. Okay, so I'm going to draw a, a quadratic graph. Okay, and we know that the roots of that graph are indeed going to be um, 1 and 2.5. So it's 1, and this is uh, 5.2 there. Okay, and so our quadratic graph is going to look like this thing. Sorry, sorry, not very smooth drawing graphs, something like that. Now, what do we want? We want this entire quadratic to be greater than zero, right? So we've got to ask ourselves the question, when is our quadratic greater than zero? Well, it's here or here, right? So these are the parts of the graph where the quadratic is greater than zero. So I'm interested in this region and I'm interested in that region. Well, what values of x give us that region? Well, either we've got x values which are greater than 5 upon 2 or which are less than 1. So in the end, our answer is going to be that x must be less than 1 or x is greater than 5 upon 2. Okay, and those are going to be our answers. Okay, then uh, question two, which is a thirds question. Um, I want to draw your attention to this statement here. Do not use a calculator in this question, right? In other words, you need to make sure you show all of your working, all of your multiplying out of thirds in order to get the marks for this question. Um, if you've used a calculator, you, you need to make sure you have written down all of that work in order to, to, to get the marks, right? You cannot just state the answer and hope that you'll get a mark. You will not because they will assume that you have used the calculator. Okay. The diagram shows two similar triangles. Now, the emphasis here is, is on the word uh, similar, right? So um, that's going to be important. Why? Well, because essentially the ratio of this length to this length is going to be equal to the ratio of this length to that length, right? That's the key. Um, okay, the height of the smaller triangle is 1 plus 7 root 5, and the height of the larger triangle is a plus b root 5, where a and b are integers. Find the values of a and b. Well, um, as I said, uh, using the property of similar triangles, we can say that a plus b root 5 uh, divided through by 1 plus 7 root 5 must be equal to 20 over 
4 plus 2 root 5. So let me just explain that. I've done that length divided by that length must be equal to that length divided by that length because it's similar. Well, if that's the case, um, we should be able to, to rearrange. So I'm going to get a plus b root 5 is equal to uh, 20 over 4 plus 2 root 5 times by uh, 1 plus 7 root 5, right? So I multiply both sides by 1 plus 7 root 5. Now, before I carry on, I think the best thing to do is always to simplify. You want to simplify early and often. And uh, I noticed that with uh, this thing here, I can divide top and bottom by 2. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rewrite this as 10 over 2 plus root 5, and then on the top, 1 plus 7 root 5 there, right? And the reason I've done that is because I'm always looking to make my life uh, easier. Now, um, we have got a, a third, a square root on the bottom. We don't like square roots on the bottom. So the way we've got to get rid of that is uh, we've got to use something called the conjugate. So if we've got 2 plus root 5 on the denominator, we're going to multiply by 2 minus root 5. And the reason for that is that it's going to enable those square roots to cancel off and disappear. So that's what I'm going to do. So let's just go down here. Uh, we are going to get on the top 10. We only have 1 times by 2, which is 2, 1 times by negative root 5, which is negative root 5, 7 root 5 times by 2, which is 14 root 5, and then 7 root 5 times by minus root 5, so we're going to get a minus 7 times by uh, 5, right, because root 5 times by root 5 is 5. And this is all over, remember I'm going to write this out in full, 2 times by 2, which is 4. And then 2 times by negative root 5 is negative 2 root 5. Root 5 times by positive 2 is positive 2 root 5. And then minus 5. Okay, now guys, as I said, it seems a bit tedious to write all that out. But I think what you're trying to do is you're trying to show to the examiner that you know what you're doing. So those guys cancel off. All right, so let's, um, let's uh, simplify the top, I think. So we've got 10 times by uh, 2. Minus root 5 plus 14 root 5 is plus 13 root 5. And uh, 7 times by 5 is 35, so that's minus 35 there. And this is all divided through by 4 minus 5, which is negative 1. Okay, well then, um, just go through the last step. We've got 2 minus 35 there is minus 33 times by um, 10 is minus 330. And then we've got 13 root 5 times by 10 is plus 130 root 5. And then this is all divided through by negative 1. And uh, if I divide through by negative 1, that becomes 330 minus uh, um, 130 root 5. Okay, so um, uh, essentially what, what I think is, is the key thing here is um, just be nice and patient. Please show all your working. I don't think it's very difficult, um, but you just want to make sure you've gone through it nice and clearly and so that you get your marks. By all means, use a calculator to check that you've got the right answer, right? I think that would be a very sensible thing to do. But as I say, the, the question says don't use a calculator. And what they mean by that is you must show every step of your working nice and clearly. So I've done a little bit of overkill here, but I think it will help you. Okay, then here we are in question three, which is a vectors question. Uh, the diagram shows a triangle OAB. The point P lies on AB, and the ratio of A to P uh, to P to B is one to three. Okay, so I think let's this, this just draw on what that actually means. So this length here is A to P is one, and P to B is, is three. Now, by the way, I actually don't mean that the length is one and three, but I, I'm just illustrating on the diagram that the ratio is one to three like that. What that means is that um, going from A to P is a quarter of going from A to B, right? So um, this this distance, right, going from there to there is a quarter of that whole thing there. Okay, now given that OA is, is equal to A and OB is equal to B, find an expression for OP. So we want to find the position vector of, um, uh, of P. So in other words, we're, we're being asked to find that thing there. Okay, and what's the easiest way to find the position vector OP? Well, it's to go from O to A and then go A to P, right? So that's what we're going to do. So O to P is equal to O to A and then plus 
A to P. Now, what did I just say a moment ago? I said AP is a quarter of AB, isn't it, right? So I can rewrite that as OA plus a quarter of AB. And then what's the vector AB? Because that's the thing that we don't know. Well, AB is OB minus OA. So a quarter of OB minus OA. Now, hopefully that should be something that you already know, right? If, if I want to find the vector AB, it's OB minus OA. If I want to find whatever BC, it's OC minus OB and so on. But let me just try to explain it if you've never really understood it. We want to find the vector that takes us from, uh, from A. Ooh, let me just get the thing, A to B, like that. Right? How do we go from A to B? Well, we can imagine it. We go A to O and then O to B, right? So we go A to O and then O to B. Well, what's the vector AO? It's that thing there is the negative of OA. So one way we can think about this is we do minus OA and then plus OB, right? And that's, that's exactly what we've got there. Okay, so now we're just uh, substituting our letters. We've got A plus a quarter of B minus A, and so, of course, if we uh, simplify that, then we've got a minus a quarter of a, which is three quarters of the vector a plus a quarter of the vector b. OK, and um, I, th I think that's that's it. And uh, hopefully that should be a reasonably uh, straightforward vectors question as well to start with. All right, then uh, here we are in the second part of this vectors question. We've got a vector Q, which has got magnitude of 12 root five and a direction of this. And a vector R has got magnitude of 15 root two and a direction of this. We want to find the unit vector in the direction Q plus R. Okay, I suspect this is going to catch out a lot of students. And the reason is, is because they're a bit shaky on the foundations of vectors and they will forget what a unit vector actually is, what it means. What is a vector? A vector has got two things. It has got direction and it has got magnitude. And both of those things must be correct in order for us to have the right vector, right? So let me put it this way. If we've got the right direction, but the wrong magnitude, then we don't have the correct vector. And vice versa, if I've got the, the right magnitude, but the wrong direction, I don't have the correct vector, right? Both of those things need, need to be uh, right in order for us to have the correct vector. So what we're looking for here in vector q is a vector that has this direction but also has that magnitude okay so the way we're going to do that is we're going to look at this direction here six negative three and we're going to find out what magnitude that guy actually is okay so i'm going to find the magnitude of the vector six negative three and the way i do that is i find the square root of six squared right which is 36 um, plus negative 3 squared, which is 9. So that guy there is the square root of uh, 45. And um, uh, uh, 45, how could I simplify that? Well, that's uh, 9 times by 5, isn't it? And uh, therefore, if I do the square root of 9 times by 5, I'm going to get 3 root 5, right? Because the square root of 9 is 3. Now, let's just have a think about that. What that means is that this vector here, the 6, negative 3, has got a size of 3 root 5. But we don't want a size of 3 root 5. What we want for Q is a vector of size 12 root 5, right? So how do we go from a vector with size 3 root 5 to a vector of size 12 root 5? Well, what we would have to do is we'd have to scale up the vector by a factor of 4. Right, so let me just kind of, I'll write that a bit more clearly here, right? What is the scale factor that we want? We want 12 root 5 divided by 3 root 5. And if we divide that through, we're going to get 4. So in other words, if I was to take this vector and multiply it up by 4, I'm going to get the vector Q. Okay, so in other words, Q is equal to 4 times by this 6, negative 3. And so that's going to be equal to 24, negative 12. Okay, it's that vector there. Um, so if, if, you're, if you're sort of uh, unsure, what I, again, what I've meant by that, it's effectively what we're saying is, um, imagine we've got this vector here. This is the vector 6, negative 3. All right. All right, so that's that vector there, uh, 6, negative 3. And what we've just found out is that that's got a length of 3 root 5. And what we need is we need a vector that is four times bigger than that. Right, so I need a vector that's still in the same direction, but it's like four times bigger. That guy, 
right? And that guy is going to have a length of 12 root 5. Yeah? And that would be our vector q. Okay, so so um, that, that's that's essentially that's essentially the idea, right? We need to have the right magnitude and the right uh, direction, right? Both those things need to be correct. So the way we do that is we take the direction vector, we find its magnitude, and then we scale it up or down so that we've got the correct um, uh, we've, we've we've got the correct magnitude as well. All right, let's do the same thing for uh, vector r. So this has got direction of negative five five. So we're going to find the magnitude of that guy. So the magnitude of negative 5, 5 is equal to the square root of negative 5 squared, which is 25, plus 5 squared, which is 25. So that's the square root of 50. 50 is 25 times by 2. So that's 5 root 2. Now, we do not want a vector of size 5 root 2. We want a vector of size 15 root 2. So how do we go from a vector of size 15 root 2 uh, sorry, 5 root 2 to 15 root 2, well, we've got to multiply it by 3. Right? So if we want to make that nice and clear, we do 15 root 2 divided by 5 root 2. That's 3. So the vector r is going to be our uh, negative 5, 5 vector, but then multiply through by 3, which is uh, negative 15, 15. Okay, now we haven't stopped there because we, we want to find the unit vector that's in the direction of q plus r. Well, firstly, what is a unit vector? It's a vector of size 1. Okay, so first of all, what we want to do is we want to find out the vector q plus r. We want to find out its magnitude, and then we want to kind of scale it so it's got a magnitude of 1. So uh, first thing we've got to do is we've got to find q plus r. So we've got uh, q plus r. That is going to be 24, negative 12, uh, plus negative 15, 15. And if I do that, I'm going to get uh, 9, 3. Okay, so that's the vector Q plus um, R. Okay, and um, what we now want to do is want to find the size of that, right? So how big is that vector? So the magnitude of 9, 3 is going to be equal to the square root of uh, 9 squared, which is 81, uh, plus the square root of, uh, plus, sorry, plus 3 squared, <laughs> beg your pun, which is 9. So we're going to have uh, the square root of 90, which is uh, 9 times by 10. So that's going to give us 3 root 10. Now, let's think about that again. So I'm saying that we've got q plus r is uh, this vector here. Right, so that vector there is q plus r, and we're saying that that's got a size of three root ten. Now, what's the unit vector? The unit vector is the vector with size of one. So we want a vector that's in the same direction, but instead of having size of three root ten, has just got a size of one. So how do we go from a, um, a vector of size three root ten to a vector of size one? Well, what we would have to do is we would have to divide by three root ten. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take, so we're going to write unit vector is um, our vector, was it 9, 3? And then we are going to divide it through by 1 upon 3 root 10, like that. And um, I think probably we would have to rationalize this. So if I was to um, expand that, uh, 9 upon 3 is 3, so that's 3 upon root 10. And then this is 1 upon root 10. We don't like to have um, thirds on denominators, so we multiply top and bottom by root 10. That would give us 3 root 10 here upon 10, and uh, root 10 upon 10. And that should be our final answer. Okay, now as I said, guys, I think it's going to catch out a lot of people, and the reason is because they're just they're a bit shaky on the fundamentals of vectors, okay? So I think it's actually quite a good question for you to um, practice on to make sure that you actually understand what's going on, right? So don't just do questions that are, you know, you just, they're standard questions, you go ahead, you do them, you're not really sure what you're doing, but you, you can kind of muddle your way through. This kind of question is, is testing really, do you know what a unit vector is? Do you understand how to get it? Uh, do you understand, um, uh, you know, uh, the ideas of magnitude and direction, why they're important and things like that, okay? So um, as always, 
Even though it's hard, um, understanding is always the best way. You want to aim for understanding if you want to do well in this subject. Okay. Okay, then here we are in question four. We are given that uh, y is equal to 3 sine squared x plus cos x. We want to show this. Now, I'm imagining that this is going to look like really complicated to a lot of people. And it's a kind of question they haven't really asked so much before, as far as I can tell. Um, but basically, what you want to do is you want to differentiate this function here and then substitute it into this thing on the left hand side. And uh, what you should get if you uh, simplify is it's going to cancel off and give you, give you something uh, there. Now, differentiating uh, 3 sine squared x plus cos x is usually a problem for students. And I think the reason is, is because uh, they, um, they don't really understand what sine squared x means. So let me write it a different way. This is 3 times by sine x all squared. I think that's a more helpful way for you to understand it, because what this shows us is that sine x is a function which is inside of the x squared function, right? So we've got a function inside of a function. And when that's the case, we use the chain rule, okay? So when we're going to differentiate here, what we're going to do is we're going to differentiate the big function, the, the kind of the 3x squared function. And if we do that, we're going to get 6 to the power of 1. So we kind of get 6 sine x to the power of 1. And then what we do is we take the function on the inside, the little function, sine x, we differentiate that, we get cos x, and we multiply through. Right, so we get that multiply through by cos x. And if I differentiate the cos x, I get negative sine x. Now, I just want to double click on that because I think that there are a lot of students I've experienced don't really understand that. The chain rule is when we've got one function inside another function. So let me give you two examples. Let's say we've got sine of x cubed. Okay, sine of x cubed. What's happening here? We have got one function, which is x cubed. That's like the little function, which is inside of the big function of sine x, right? So we've got one function x cubed, which is inside of the big function sine. That is different to say this, where we've got y is equal to sine x all cubed, right? Because here it's kind of reversed. Our little function on the inside is sine x, uh, which is inside the bigger function x cubed. But the way we differentiate is effectively the, the same principle. We differentiate the big function first. So in this case, sine is the big function. So we differentiate it, we get cos. So we get cos x cubed. And then we uh, differentiate the little function uh, x cubed. And if we differentiate that, we get uh, 3x squared. And so we multiply through by 3x squared. Or it's probably better to write that as uh, 3x squared times by cos of x cubed. Whereas for this case, when we've got sine x all cubed, the big function is um, the like basically x cubed, right? This whole thing cubed. So when we differentiate that, we get 3 sine x to the power of 2. Okay. And then we differentiate the little function on the inside, which in this case is sine x. And if we uh, differentiate sine x, we get cos x and we multiply through. Okay. So hopefully that will um, clarify for you what's going on here because. Um, Basically, a lot of students will miss out the fact that this thing, sine squared x, is uh, really sine x inside of the, the x squared function. All right? And because it's a function inside another function, therefore you need to use the, uh, the chain rule. Okay, now, th now that we've got that, what we need to do is we just need to substitute in. So we have got y um, plus cot x dy dx. So y is 3 sine squared x plus cos x. Okay, so we write that down. 3 sine squared x plus cos x, and then um, plus cot x, so plus cot x, um, times by our dy dx, which was 6 sine x cos x minus sine x. So uh, 6 sine x cos x, minus sine x. Okay. All right then. Um, then we, we just need to we just need to simplify this basically. So what's this going to be equal to? We're going to get 3 sine squared x plus cos x. Now what is cot? Cot is um, 1 divided by tan, right? Because the third letter there is T, right? So sec, the third letter is C, so it's 1 upon cos. Cosec, the third letter is S, so it's 1 upon sine. Cot the third letter is t, so it's 1 divided by tan. 
And tan is sine divided by cos, so we can rewrite cot as cos x divided by sine x times by 6 sine x cos x minus sine x. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to expand that bracket. Okay, so we get here 3 sine squared x plus cos x. If I expand out, then the sine x is going to cancel, so I'm going to be left with 6 sine, sorry, not 6 sine, <laughs> beg your pardon, 6 cos squared x, right, because I got a cos x here times by a cos x, that's cos squared, and the sine divided by sine, that cancels off. And then here what I'm going to get is uh, minus cos x, right, because the sine again cancels off. Now, We've got a cos x minus cos x, so those guys are going to disappear. They knock each other off. And so I've got a 3 sine squared x plus 6 cos squared x. Well, in my expression that I'm looking for, we've just got a cos squared. So what I can do is I can replace that sine squared with 1 minus cos squared. Because hopefully you should know, using your trig identities, that a sine squared plus cos squared is 1. And therefore, sine squared is the same as 1 minus cos squared. So if I was to simplify this, I get 3 minus 3 cos squared x plus 6 cos squared x, which is plus 3 cos squared x. And so uh, this simplifies to give 3 bracket 1 plus cos squared x. So um, that is the answer that we're looking for, where k is equal to 3. OK, then uh, using your value of k, solve the equation um, k bracket 1 plus cos squared x is equal to 4 um, for the domain of uh, negative pi to positive pi. OK, well, we got uh, k is equal to 3. So this is 3 bracket 1 plus cos squared x is equal to 4. So that's going to be 1 plus cos squared x is equal to uh, 4 divided by 3 and uh, therefore cos squared x is equal to 1 upon 3 because we get 4 upon 3 minus 3 upon 3 and then if we were to square root both sides we're going to get uh, cos x is equal to plus or minus 1 upon root 3 right so that's where um, in my view people are going to go wrong Okay, so we want to solve cos x is equal to plus or minus 1 upon root 3. All right, I mean, there are, there are a couple of ways uh, to do that. I think in, in this case, one, I use the graph, the cos graph. I know people don't like graphs, but I like them. And personally, I think they actually really help. But, you know, it's up to you. Um, what does the cos graph look like? The cos graph kind of looks like that. So it goes down like that. That's up to negative pi. And then uh, down to here. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, so what I've done there is I've drawn the cos graph from uh, negative pi all the way up to uh, positive pi, and that's 1, and that's uh, negative 1. This is pi by 2. This is minus pi by 2. And what do we want to do? We want to solve when cos x is equal to um, uh, positive 1 upon root 3. So I can imagine drawing that kind of like, like this. Uh, I don't know. I'll draw it like that. Okay, and this would be a negative 1 upon root 3. So I'm going to get here, this is positive 1 upon root 3, beg your pardon. This is negative 1 upon root 3. And so uh, what we're really asking to find is, can we find those intersection points there and there and there and there? And of course, um, what we can do is we can use our uh, calculator to find those two values and then use the property of reflection to find the other two values. So let's just try to do that. Okay, so if I find the cos inverse of positive 1 upon root 3, uh, then the value that I get in my calculator is 0 0.955. Uh, so what's that going to be? That's going to be this guy here, right? So that's uh, 0 0.955. And of course, what that means is that by reflection, this value here is going to be negative 0 0.955, right? Because the y-axis is the line of symmetry for uh, the cos graph. And then if I do the uh, cos inverse of negative uh, 1 upon uh, root 3, then what I'm going to get is a value of uh, 2.186. So I think it needs to be three significant figures, isn't it? So 2.19. 
So that guy there is uh, 2.19. And again, via symmetry, this is going to be negative 2.19. So in the end, my answers for x are going to be x is equal to uh, negative 2.19 negative 0 0.955, uh, 0 0.955, and uh, 2.19. Okay, uh, and so those should be my answers. And of course, you can always check them by substituting them into the original equation and seeing if it gives you what you want. Okay, then part B of this question. First, we want to differentiate this function here with respect to x. Um, well, going back to what I said in part A of this question, this is a chain rule. And the reason it's a chain rule is we've got one function, which is x minus root x, inside another function, which is the tan function. So I'm just going to rewrite this a little bit. We've got y is equal to tan x minus x to the power of a half. So write it in indices form. And uh, if I was to differentiate this, therefore, what I've got to do is I've got to differentiate the big function first. So tan differentiates to give sec squared. So I've got sec squared x minus uh, the square root of x, or x to the power of a half. Then what I've got to do is I've got to differentiate the little function on the inside, this thing, and multiply through. So if I differentiate x, I get 1. And if I differentiate x to the power of a half, I get a half x to the power of minus a half. Okay, so again, what have I done? I've differentiated the big function, I get sec squared. And then I take the little function on the inside, I differentiate that, and I multiply through. Well, um, I'm going to try to simplify this a little bit, I think. So this is uh, 1 minus 1 upon 2 root x times by sec squared x minus root x, okay? And um, I think you could probably go a little bit further than that. Um, I could simplify the fractions here by giving uh, the 1 a same denominator. So I make that a denominator of 2 root x. So if I was to do that, this thing here would become uh, 2 root x over 2 root x. And of course, I can combine that in this way to make this all uh, 2 root x minus 1, all divided through by 2 root x. So I'll just, I'll just tidy that up a tiny little bit. Okay, so this guy here is 2 root x minus 1 over uh, 2 root x times by sec squared x minus root x. Okay, now then, that leads us on to part two, because the key thing in part two is this word here, it's the word hence, right? Hence, we've got to find this integral. Now, every time you've got this type of question where the first part is uh, differentiating and the second part is integrating, what you've got to understand is that integration is the reverse of differentiation. Okay, so what that means in this case is, if I take this function here, and I differentiate it, and I get that function there, what that means is if I was to integrate this whole thing, if I was to integrate that thing, I would get back to where I started, I would get tan x minus root x. So in other words, what I strongly encourage you all to do is in these questions, take the function you got for your dy dx, and then write that as an integral, and then set it equal to this thing here, the function you started with. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to say the uh, integral of uh, 2 root x minus 1 over 2 root x times by sec squared x minus root x. Well, uh, what is sec squared? It's just 1 over cos squared, isn't it? So I'm going to write that like that. 1 over cos squared x minus root x dx that's got to be equal to tan x minus root x plus c, right? So just to clarify, again, what have I done? I've rewritten my differentiation as an integration. I've taken that thing there, which is my dy dx, and I say, if I integrate that whole thing, I get back where I started. Now, let's think about this. This term here is very, very similar to this term here. Right? And uh, hopefully if I just um, rewrite it, it'll become a little bit more clear. So this is the integral of 2 root x minus 1 divided through by, oh, sorry, it's a bit ugly, divided through by uh, 2 root x times by cos squared x minus root x dx is equal to tan 
x minus root x plus c. Okay, now what's the difference between what we've got here and the function we're asked to integrate? The only difference is that guy there, it's that two, right? So this thing, oh, sorry, this thing's the only difference. So um, how, can I, how can I change it? Well, what I could do is I could multiply both sides by two, right? If I was to multiply the left-hand side by two, then that would cancel out the two on the denominator. But of course, if I do that, I'd have to multiply the right-hand side by two as well. So in other words, what I can do is I can say that the uh, integral of two root x minus one over square root x cos squared x minus root x dx is equal to two tan x minus root x plus c. Okay, so in other words, I look at the function I've got here, that I'm trying to integrate, I try to see um, what I need to do in order to uh, convert it into the form I want. And I see that really what I've got to do is just got to multiply it by two. So if I multiply it by two, I've also got to multiply uh, this whole thing through by two as well. By the way, I didn't multiply the c by two because c just stands for a constant, right? So it doesn't really matter, right? If it's a constant or it's double it, it makes, makes no difference, okay? Okay, so this is question five. The variables x and y are related by this equation here. We want to use differentiation to find the approximate change in y as x increases from one to one plus h, where h is small. Um, and the key thing here is the word approximate, which means we're using the following relation that delta y over delta x is approximately equal to dy dx, which is the gradient of the tangent, um, taken from the point that we're interested in. In this case, that's x is equal to 1. Now, I think um, it's just worthwhile me trying to explain that for people who have never really understood it. So I'm going to try to draw a graph. This graph is not the graph of the function in the question, by the way. It's just, just kind of like a random graph. So let's say we've got a curve that looks something like this. We Okay. And um, so we've got a point here. Let's call that point, I don't know, point A. We've got another point here, point B, and the point is that, that um, B is like quite close to A, so it's just a small increase. Now then, we could say, therefore, um, that this guy here is a little distance in X across, so that's delta X, and B is uh, a little distance as well in Y across, right? So um, the change that takes us from A to B is a little change in X delta X, over a little change in y, uh, delta y. Okay, now then, that means that the gradient of the line AB, let me just draw that, so that thing there, the gradient of the line AB is going to be the increase in y, delta y, divided by the increase in x, delta x. Okay, so, so the gradient of that line, the gradient of AB is equal to delta y, over delta x. Okay, then, well, um, let's say we were to take the tangent at a, right? So I'll draw the tangent at a, that's kind of like that thing there. Okay, now how do we find the tangent at a? Well, we, we differentiate the curve, don't we? So if we differentiate the curve, we get dy dx. Okay, dy dx. And um, uh, how do we find the gradient at that particular value of a? Well, what we do is we substitute in the x coordinate for a. So the way I write that is kind of I use this notation here. So dy dx is we differentiate the curve, and then this kind of thing means we substitute in the x value at the point a into dy dx, and that's going to give us the gradient of that line. Now the whole point is, right, is that as b gets closer and closer to a, basically the gradient of that red line is effectively the same, or very, very close to, the gradient of the green line. Right, so in other words, we can say, so long as b is close to a, this thing here, delta y upon delta x, is is approximately the same thing as the gradient of the tangent dy dx taken at the point a. Okay, so that's the idea. So what we're going to do is we're going to differentiate this function and we're going to substitute in the starting x coordinate, which in this case is one. All right, so how are we going to differentiate this? Well, we've got to use the quotient rule, haven't we? So let's just write that down. So we've got the function uh, y is equal to x upon ln 3x. And uh, we're using the quotient rule because we've got one function divided by another function. So the function on the top, we're going to call u. The function on the bottom, we're going to call v. And uh, we're going to differentiate both of these. So u prime is equal to 1, and v prime 
is one upon three x times by three. So three x upon uh, th three upon three x. Beg your pardon. Um, basically, whatever's inside the natural log that goes on the denominator. Then you differentiate it and you stick whatever you get onto the numerator. So three x of a differentiator, I get three. Stick it on the on the numerator, and that of course is the same as one upon x. So then, what we've got to do is we've got to use the uh, quotient rule. What is the quotient rule? It is v du. So ln three x times by one, which is ln three x minus u dv, which is x times by 1 upon x. So I'm just going to write that out nice in full just to show the examiner that I know what I'm doing. Uh, all over v squared, which is ln uh, 3x, all squared. Right. So I'm going to put that in a bracket as well because ln of 3x squared is different to ln 3x all squared. OK, then. Um, what I want to do is I want to find this value when x is equal to 1, right? So uh, dy dx at x is equal to 1. So I'm just going to substitute x is equal to 1 into here. That's going to give me ln 3 minus, well, the x divided by x cancels off and just gives me 1, all over uh, ln 3 squared. Okay? And then uh, what we said earlier is that uh, delta y over delta x is approximately equal to dy dx. So it's going to be approximately equal to this thing, ln 3 minus 1 upon ln 3 all squared. And then um, in this case, what's our delta x? Our delta x is our small increase in x, and that small increase in x is just h, right? So we can replace delta x with h, which means that delta y, our small increase in y, is going to be equal to ln 3 minus 1 over ln 3 all squared times by h, right? So that would be our exact answer. Okay. And uh, probably what we need to do is we need to just key that into a calculator uh, to get a particular value. So let me just do that uh, for a second. Okay. So when I put that into a calculator, what I get is 0 0.0817. Okay. So 0.0817h. Okay, I think the answer says leave it in three significant figures, isn't it? So I think that should be enough. Okay. Um, all right. Now, I think that um, when you're preparing for your exams, right, um, sometimes having keywords helps. The keyword here is approximate. If you see the word approximate, you know you've got to be using that. But I think, guys, you want to try to understand the diagram that I've drawn here on the right as much as possible. Um, again, for, this, for the simple reason, right, the more you understand, actually, the easier it is to do, to do these questions, right? So don't just rest on the formula. Try to understand where the formula comes from, what it means. Okay, this is question six. Um, find the exact area of the region enclosed by the curve blah, the x-axis, the line x equals negative a quarter, and the line x equals um, 0 0.5. Okay, well, you could sketch this graph um, to try to understand it, but I'm hoping that most of you can recognize this is essentially an integration, right? If you want to find the area enclosed by a curve in the x-axis, you basically integrate the curve, and uh, we're integrating it here between a negative a quarter and, and a half, right? So I th hopefully that should be... Um, uh, relatively straightforward, and you notice that this is only worth four marks, right? So it, it shouldn't be too complicated. So we're going to integrate e to the 2 minus 4x dx between negative a quarter and positive a half. If we were to integrate uh, this function, if we integrate the exponential, the exponential basically remains the same, but then we take the coefficient of the x, which in this case is uh, negative 4, and we divide through by negative 4. So we're going to get that thing there. And then we need to remember to integrate between our bounds of a half and negative a quarter. So we're going to substitute in um, the top bound, or the upper bound, a half first. So that's going to give us negative 1 upon 4 e to the 2 minus, well, 4 times by a half is 2, right, like that. And then um, if we were to substitute in negative a quarter, we get here negative a quarter e to the power of 2. Um, well, what's a negative 4 times by negative a quarter? It's going to be positive 1. So if we were to simplify this, this is uh, negative a quarter of e to the power of 0 minus minus so plus uh, a quarter e to the power of three. 
Now, e to the power of zero is just one. So what we end up with here is a quarter e to the power of three minus a quarter. Uh, or if you want to factorize it, you could write it as a quarter uh, e to the power of three minus one. Okay, now the question asks you to find the exact area. So that, of course, is the exact value, but you could uh, key it into the calculator as well uh, to, to get an answer to three significant figures. Um, but here, because it says exact, you just, just need to uh, have it in this form is uh, sufficient. Okay, here we are in question seven. Um, we've got two curves here that intersect at the points P and Q. Find the coordinates of P and Q. Well, this is just simultaneous equations. So um, how can we do this? Well, we can substitute this into this curve here. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. So we've got 4x squared minus 3y is 2 upon x, all squared, plus x times by y, which is 2 upon x is equal to 24. All right, so let's uh, try to simplify this. This is 4x squared minus 3 times by 2 squared is 4, and x squared is just x squared. So I'll put that in brackets there. Um, plus, well, the x's are going to cancel out there, so we're just left with 2 is equal to 24. And um, we, we want to uh, get rid of the fractions, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply everything through by x squared. So if I do that, I'm going to get here 4x to the power of 4. I'm going to get minus 12, right? 3 times by 4 is 12. And of course, if I'm multiplying through by x squared, then the x squared on the denominator cancels. Um, plus uh, 2x squared is equal to 24x squared. And if I was to rewrite this, I've got 4x to the 4. Uh, minus 22x squared minus 12 is equal to zero. And uh, I think I'll probably um, simplify this even further just by dividing through by two. So 2x to the four minus 11x squared minus six is equal to zero. And uh, hopefully what you can notice is this is essentially a quadratic, but to make it clear, I'll use a substitution. Let u equal x squared, right? And that means that what we've got here is 2u squared minus 11u minus 6 is equal to 0. And um, uh, does that factorize? I'm hoping it does. Let's just see. I want two numbers that are going to multiply together to give 6. So I think a negative 6 plus 1 is my guess. Let's just uh, check that out. So uh, 1 times by negative 6 gives negative 6. 2u times by negative 6 is negative 12u. Plus 1u is negative 11u. So I think that's all fine. So we're going to end up with um, u is equal to negative 1 half, or u is equal to positive 6. And of course, u is equal to x squared. So x squared is equal to negative 1 half. Well, um, from your point of view, there are no solutions for that, or no real solutions. No real solutions. OK, um, but if x squared is equal to 6, then you have got two solutions. x is equal to plus or minus root 6. OK, and um, we want to find the two coordinates, right? So uh, y is 2 divided by x. So let's just find the y coordinates. When x is equal to positive root 6, y is equal to 2 divided by root 6. We should rationalize. We rationalize by multiplying top and bottom by root 6. So that gives us 2 root 6 upon 6, which is root 6 upon 3. Okay, so we end up there with the uh, coordinate P is root 6, comma, root 6 upon 3. And when x is equal to negative root 6, uh, y, well, it's just basically going to give us the, the, the same thing just with a negative in front, right? Minus root 6 upon 3. So the coordinate Q there is going to be root 6, comma, minus root 6 upon 3. All right. Okay, then uh, part B, we want to find the length of PQ. And um, to do that, we just need to know the formula, don't we? So the length of a line is given by the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. Uh, so here, um, what are we going to get? We are going to get uh, x2, which is this guy, negative root 6, minus this guy, so minus root 6, 
all squared. So we get negative root 6 minus root 6 all squared plus y2 minus y1, which is minus root 6 upon 3 minus root 6 upon 3 all squared. And of course, we've got to square root that. So I'll just, I'll just put a square there on the other side uh, just to make it a bit neater, I think. Um, so what do we got here? This is minus 2 root 6 all squared um, plus minus 2 root 6 upon 3 all squared. So now let's uh, square these. So um, firstly, negative times negative is a positive, isn't it? Uh, 2 squared is 4 and root 6 squared is 6. So we got 4 times by 6 there. And um, with this guy again, negative times a negative is positive. Uh, 2 times by 2 is uh, 4. Root 6 times by root 6 is 6. And 3 squared is 9. Okay. And so uh, this guy here is going to be 24 uh, plus 24 upon 9. But I think we can actually simplify this, can't we? Let's divide top and bottom by 3. So that would be 2 and that would be 3 there. So with 8 upon 3. And uh, I think we can uh, add these guys up. So um, we can uh, change 24 to be thirds, right? So 24 times by 3 is 60 plus 12, 72. So 72 thirds plus 8 thirds is 80 thirds. And so therefore, um, uh, PQ is going to be the square root of 80 thirds. So the square root of 80 thirds. Um, but we, we're going to need to simplify this, aren't we? So um, 80 is 16 times by 5. So that's going to be 4 uh, root 5 over root 3. And we're going to want to rationalize top and bottom. So we're going to multiply top and bottom by root 3. So that's going to give us 4 root 5 times by root 3 over 3. And so therefore, uh, this guy will be 4 root 3 times by root 15. And so I think that's going to be the best answer that we can get. So A is rational. So A is four thirds and B is the smallest possible integer. Well, yeah, because 15 doesn't factorize anymore to give squares that will simplify. OK, so that should be our answer. All right, so here we are in question eight. Um, the variables Y and X are known to be connected with the relationship Y equals A times B to the X, where A and B are constants. Table shows the values for y and certain values for x. We want to draw the graph of log y against x. Well, that means, first of all, we've got to calculate the values of log y. And to do that, we've just got to put them into the calculator. So let me just do that. So log 38 is 1, 1. 1.6. OK, it's, uh, close enough. Uh, log 150 is 2.2. .2. Log 600 is 2.8. Uh, log 20500, 4.3. And log 82000 is 4.9. OK, I've only done to one decimal place because I know that on my graph, I can only realistically draw it to an accuracy of one decimal place. OK, so now what I want to do is want to uh, plot the points on. OK, so when X is 1, log Y is 1.6. So let's uh, try to put that on. 1 and 1.6 is like roughly there. OK, next, uh, X is 3, log Y is 2.2. Uh, so like roughly there, it's kind of hard for me to do this, by the way, with the, with the screen. So my answer is probably going to be not as accurate, uh, five and 2.8. So five, I think is there 2.8 is like there, I think. Like that. And 10, 4.3. So that's 10, 4.3, I think is there. Yep. And then uh, 12 is 4.9. So that's like that. Okay. And um, probably the best thing to do is want to draw a line of best fit, I think. So if I was to do that, who, um, yeah, I think that's probably good enough like that. Okay. All right. So that's the first part of this question.
Okay, then part B, uh, use your graph to find the values of A and B, giving each to one significant figure. Well, okay, I think to, to do this, let's just write down the equation uh, that we're given in the question. So we're told that Y is equal to A times by B to the power of X. Let me just, um, let me just double check that. Yeah. And I think with all these questions, basically what you want to do is you want to log both sides. So we're going to use log base 10 because that's what we've got in the question. So log y is equal to log uh, a times by b to the power of x. And uh, then what we can do is we can use the log rules, right? Because log of a b is equal to log a plus log b. So here I'm going to get log a plus log b to the power of x and then we can use another log rule on this term to bring the power of x down to the front so that means i can write this as log a plus x times by log b now what i'm going to do is i'm going to rewrite this in a slightly different way i'm going to write this as uh, log y is equal to log b uh, times by x plus log a and the reason i've done that is because this graph i hope you can see is actually a y equals m x plus c graph okay now why is that well what we've got here is we've got our variables x and y right so our variable x there is unchanged let me just uh, get that Okay, why is that not working? There we go. Our x is there unchanged. And um, log y is like our new big y right there. Okay, so if I was to plot x against log y, I'm going get to a, get a straight line graph. And uh, our log b there is a constant, so that's like our gradient m. And our log a is also a constant, and that's our y-intercept c. So hopefully um, what you can see is that if we have the graph uh, log y against little x, it actually forms a y equals mx plus c graph, where the m is equal to log b, and uh, the y-intercept is equal to log a. Um, so that's really the, the important result for us to write down. Okay, the important result is that the gradient m is going to be equal to log b, and that uh, the y-intercept c is going to be equal to log a, right? So in other words, if we want to find b and we want to find a, what we really want to do is want to find the y-intercept and we want to find the gradient. So let's go to our graph. How do we find the gradient? Well, um, probably the easiest thing to do is just to use two points. So if I was to use these two points here, like that, and like that, I should be able to find the, the gradient of my line. So I'm going to be using, I'll highlight it in yellow, shall I? I'm going to use um, the two extreme points, that point there and that point there. Okay, so let's do that. So the gradient M is going to equal to Y2 minus Y1, so 4.9 minus 1.6 over x2 minus x1, which is 12 minus uh, 1. Okay, so now if I just uh, key that into my calculator, so uh, 4.9 minus 1.6 is 3.3, and then divided through by 11 is 0 0.3. So I get a gradient there of 0 0.3. And um, what's my wine set? Well, I'm probably going to get this a little bit inaccurate, right? Because I have to use the, the laptop screen, but I think that is 1.123, 1 1.3. I don't know. Could be 1.2, something like that. So I'm going to go down here now. And I would say my uh, gradient is 0 0.3. And I'm going to say that my y intercept is 1.3. And so therefore, if I just convert to exponential form, b is going to equal to 10 to the power of 0 0.3, and a is going to equal to um, 10 to the power of 1.3. And so I'm just going to key both those into the calculator. So uh, 10 to the power of 0 0.3 is 1.995. So uh, they wanted it, was it two significant figures? No, one significant figure. So b is 2, and a is 10 to the power of 1.3.
uh, 19.95. So A is equal to 20. Okay, because that's to one significant figure. All right, so I think really the, the key idea is, is understanding this thing uh, here, right? Um, is you should, I hope, by the time you enter the exam, be comfortable with recognizing that this form here is Y equals MX plus C and being able to understand what your gradient, what your Y intercept is. If you can do that, a lot of these questions hopefully should become quite straightforward. Okay, part C of this question, find an estimate of X when Y is equal to uh, 1500. Well, I think the keyword here is estimate. So I think we can use the graph. Uh, on the graph, we've got log uh, Y against X. So what we want to do is want to find log 1500. So if I put that into my calculator, so I get log 1500 is 3.17. So, okay, so that's 3.2 basically for our graph. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to my graph and find out where 3.2 is. Okay, which is there. I'm going to read it across and I'm going to read down. Ooh, and that to me looks like it is 6.4, I guess, 6.3, 6.4. Okay, so I'm going to put X is equal to 6.4 i think now the mark scheme isn't out yet for this paper so it may well be when the mark scheme comes out that the answer is a little bit different but i hope you understand that i'm just doing it on the screen the screen's not very accurate uh, hopefully you guys can do it a little bit more accurately than me but the basic idea um, is that you can just use the graph and notice it's only worth two marks all right then here we are in question nine which is a circular measure um, style of question so the diagram shows a company logo. Each part of the logo is a sector of a circle with center O. The sector uh, AOB has radius X, right? So I think let's, um, let's just write everything on, right? So that there is a length of X, okay? And COD has a radius of X plus two, right? So, so this whole length here is X plus two, okay? So that means that this length here is two from there to there. And this length here is x plus 2. So let's just draw that on. And uh, that also means that this length here is also x plus 2. Okay, so let's just draw that on. So x plus 2. And uh, EOF has a radius of y. So that length there has got a radius of y. Okay. All right, um, the shaded region has area A and perimeter 24. Well, and the first thing that we want to do is we want to find an expression for the perimeter, don't we? So how are we going to get the perimeter? Well, we need that length plus that length plus that length plus this length plus this length plus this length plus this length. So let's just be nice and patient. We're going to need to calculate a couple of things. First thing we want to do is we want to calculate that arc length, right? Now, what's the formula for the arc length of... Um, of a sector, well, S is equal to R theta, right? Where R is the radius and theta is the angle in radians. So, so what's this arc length here going to be? Well, it's going to be um, the, the radius, which is X, times by um, the angle, which is 0 0.5. So we're going to get here a half X, okay? So 0 0.5 X. What about this arc length there? Well, again, same thing. What's the radius? X plus 2. And what's the uh, angle? It's 2. So we're going to get X plus 2 times by 2. Okay, now, um, what's this arc length here? We've got to do the same thing. What's the radius? Y. What's the angle? 1. So this is Y times by 1, or just Y. And I think the last thing we just want to be a little bit careful about, it's kind of a bit of a trap here, I think. A lot of people are going to assume that that length is 2. But if you think about it, it's got to be X plus 2 minus Y. Because this length here, remember, is not X, that's Y. So that length is X plus 2 minus Y. Okay, well, if that's the case, then we should be able to get an expression for the whole perimeter. The perimeter is going to be equal to, let's go around it in order, x plus a half x plus 2 plus x plus 2 times by 2 plus x plus 2 minus y plus y plus y. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to go around again in order. x plus a half x plus 2 plus x plus 2 times by 2. So that's going to be 2x plus 4. Sorry about that. 2x plus 4. Um, plus x plus 2 minus y. So plus 
x plus 2 minus y, sorry about all the um, going on to another line, uh, plus y plus y. So let's try to tidy all of that up. So we have got uh, x plus a half x, right? So that's uh, uh, 1 and a half x uh, plus uh, 2x is uh, 3 and a half x um, plus this is going to be 4 and a half x. So I get there, that's 9 upon 2x. Let me just, uh, redo that just to make sure. x, that's 3 upon 2x, 5 upon Sorry, x, 3 upon 2x, 7 upon 2x, right? So that's 2x plus that, 9 upon 2x. Yes, I agree with that. Okay, then let's do the y's. We have got minus y plus y, which is 0, plus y. So we go, so we get plus y there. And then let's deal with all the constants. So we've got 2 plus 4 is 6, plus 2 is 8. So that's 8 there. And we're told in the question that the perimeter is equal to 24. So I think now what we can do is we can rearrange this and get y is equal to 24 minus 8, which is 16, minus 9 upon 2x. Okay, so we've got an expression there for, for y in terms of x. Now the question is, we want to show that the area is equal to, to this function here. Okay, well then how do we get the, uh, the area of a sector? Well, we need to know the other formula. The area of the sector formula is a is equal to a half r squared theta, again where theta is in radians. So this sector here, that guy, is going to be a half of x squared times by this angle, 0 0.5. This sector here is going to be a half of uh, x plus 2 squared times by the angle, which is 2. And this sector here is going to be a half of y squared times by the angle, which is 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write all of that out. So the area is equal to a half r squared. So in this case, that's going to be x squared times by a half plus a half. Now for the next sector, the radius was x plus 2. So we've got x plus 2 squared times by the angle, which was 2. And then the last one is a half y squared times by the angle, which is 1. Okay, now I think what we can do is we can um, try to simplify all this. So that's going to be a quarter x squared plus, well, um, the half and the two cancel, don't they? So we're just left with x plus two all squared, which is x squared plus four x plus four um, plus a half of y squared. Now we learned in the um, earlier part that y is 16 minus nine upon two x. So this is 16 minus 9 upon 2x, all squared. Okay, well, let's um, try to simplify. A quarter x, plus a, a quarter x squared plus x squared is 5 upon 4x squared plus 4x plus 4 plus a half of, well, let's expand this whole thing, uh, 16 squared. Is that, I think it's 256, isn't it? Sorry, I brain's not fully functioning. Let me just check that with the calculator. 16 times 16. Yeah, 256. And um, 16 times by 9 upon 2. Well, that's going to be the same thing as 8 times by 9, isn't it? Um, which is 72. We've got two of them. So that's minus 144x. And then we've got um, the negative 9 upon 2x all squared, which is going to be positive 81 upon 4x squared. Okay, then, so let's just keep going nice and patiently through this. I think patience is the key. Okay, so we get that, that, that. Let's expand everything through by a half. So 256 divided by 2 is 128 minus 72x plus 81 upon 8x squared. Okay, then, um, well, let's combine the terms. Um, 5 upon 4x squared is the same as 10 upon 8x squared. So if I add that to 81 upon 8, that's 91 upon 8x squared. Uh, 4x minus 72x is minus 68x. And 4 plus 128 is 132. Now, hopefully that should match up with what we're told in the question, which it does. Okay, so that's the, that's the answer there to part A.
All right, then part B of this question, we want to find differentiation to find the minimum possible area of the logo. Um, okay, then um, uh, how do we do that? Well, the minimum is basically going to be where the, the first derivative is equal to zero. So we want to find uh, when dA dx is equal to zero. So minimum is at the point where dA dx is equal to zero. So we're going to differentiate our function. So dA dx is going to be equal to 91 upon 4x minus 68. And we're going to set that equal to zero. So when the ADX is equal to zero, then what we've got is zero is equal to 91 upon 4x minus 68, which means that uh, x is going to be equal to 68 times by 4 upon 91. And um, uh, we could try to simplify that. Um, but the, the question basically asks us to find the area, doesn't it? Find the minimum possible area of the logo. So we need to substitute that value into our expression for A. So uh, when X is equal to um, this, this whole thing, right? So 4 times by 68 upon 91. Then what's A going to be equal to? Well, A was equal to 91 upon 8 times by X squared. Yeah, so 4 times by 68 upon 91 all squared, uh, then minus 68x, so minus 68, 4 times by 68 upon 91, and then duh, 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 plus 132. Okay, now hang on, I don't have a calculator with me, so I better quickly go find one so I can calculate what that value is. Okay, if I key that all in, I get 30.37. So um, I think you need to give it to three significant figures. So 30.4, I think should be an adequate answer. So 30.4 should be your answer. Let me just go back and check because that is worth five marks. I'm slightly puzzled why it's worth so many marks um but i can't see anything else to do so um uh yeah so i think the area there 30.4 that should be sufficient okay then question 10 which is a binomial expansion question the expansion of this thing here in ascending powers of x that means the the x powers get bigger right so x to the power of zero x to the power one x to the power two begins in this way where n a and b are positive integers we want to show that a uh, to the power of n upon two minus four is equal to this all right well the first thing we want to do is we, we've got to expand haven't we so we've got a plus x upon a to the power of n and we want to expand to get the first two terms well the way we expand this is this is going to be nc0 uh, a to the power of n x upon a to the power of zero right because we're starting with the smallest uh, powers of x then we've got nc1 uh, a to the power of n minus one uh, times by x upon a to the power of one and of course, we've got other terms, but at the moment, we don't care about those. All right, then uh, nc0 is just 1, because anything c0 is 1. Um, and then we're going to have here a to the power of n. And then um, x upon a to the power of 0 is 1, because anything to the power of 0 is 1. Next, nc1 is n, right? 5c1 is 5, 6c1 is 6, 7c1 uh, is 7. So nc1 is n. You can check it on a calculator if you want. Uh, times by a to the power of n minus 1 divided by a uh, times by x. Okay, now then, we can use an indices rule here um, because hopefully you will remember that if we've got a to the power of x divided by a to the power of y, what we do is we subtract the powers, that's a to the power of x minus y. So um, this thing, a to the power of n minus 1 divided by a, uh, is going to simplify to give a to the power of n minus 1 minus 1, which is a to the power of n minus 2. Okay, so now if I simplify all this, we get a to the n plus n times by a to the power of n minus 2, right? So just again, clarify that. But n minus 1 minus 1 is n minus 2, like that, times by x plus dot, 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 dot. Now, 
we know that what we've got should correspond to this guy here. So in other words, uh, this thing, the a to the power of n, right, that's going to be our b to the 4, right, because that's the constant term. And this thing here, the n a to the power of n minus 2, is going to be our 48 b cubed. It's going to be that term there. Okay, so that's going to be 48 b cubed, right? So by comparison, we are comparing the constant term, we're comparing the uh, x term. So we've got two equations. We've got um, uh, b to the power of 4 is equal to a to the power of n. That's one equation. And the second equation that we've got is um, uh, 48 b to the power of 3 is equal to n times by a to the power of n minus 2. Now, what we are asked to show is, uh, is this thing. Now, there are no b's in there. So what that means is basically we've got to um, cancel out the b's. So the first job I'm going to do is I'm going to take the first equation and I'm going to rearrange it. So probably a good idea if I label my equations, right? I call that equation one, that equation two. So if I rearrange equation one, I'm going to get b is equal to a to the power of n upon four. In other words, I, um, I raise both sides to the power of a quarter. So if you're not sure what I've just done, right, I've basically done that. Or I've done the fourth root of both sides. Okay, so that means on the left-hand side, b to the power of 4 to the power of a quarter is just b to the power of 1. And a to the power of n to the power of a quarter is a to the power of n upon 4. That's that. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute into equation 2. So I'm going to substitute into equation 2. And so that's going to give me 48 times by b, which we just said is a to the power of n upon 4 to the power of 3, is equal to n times by a to the power of n minus 2. All right, now, I'm going to deal with that guy first, a to the power of n upon 4 to the power of 3. So my other indice rule, which hopefully you know, is that if I've got a to the power of x to the power of y, then I multiply the powers. I get a to the power of x times by y. So this guy here is going to be 48 uh, times by a to the power of 3n upon 4, right? Because n upon 4 times by 3 is 3n upon 4. And that's equal to n uh, times by a to the power of n minus 2. All right. Now, I think at this point, it's helpful to have a look at what we are aiming for. We are aiming for this expression here. And notice that what we've got, we've got a 48 upon n term. So I'm going to aim for 48 upon n. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to divide both sides by n. So I get here 48 upon n. And I'm going to divide both sides by uh, a to the power of 3n upon 4. So in other words, basically, I'm bringing the n to the left and then taking that guy to the right. So I'm going to get uh, a to the power of n minus 2 over a to the power of uh, 3n upon 4. And um, hopefully what you can recognize again is we've, we've got a situation we've got a to some power divided by a to another power. So what we're going to do is we're going to subtract the powers. So on the right-hand side here, we're going to have a to the power of n minus 2 uh, minus 3n upon 4. Okay, and n minus 3n upon 4 is, is a quarter of n, right? So that's a to the power of n upon 4 minus 2 is equal to 48 upon n. Okay, well then um, what we're asked in, in the question is to get 48 upon n squared. So what I'm going to do is we're just going to square both sides. And uh, if I square both sides, then what I'm going to get is uh, 48 upon n squared. So there's no change there. But on the right-hand side, I'm going to multiply through by uh, my power by 2, which gives me a to the power of n upon 2 minus 4. And I think that is what I'm asked to find. Yeah. Okay, so that's quite tricky. The algebra there is not easy, but uh, that's the way you do it. Okay, then part B of this question, um, given also that the third term is 1056b squared x squared, find the values of n, a, and b. Well, okay, uh, we had the expansion, wasn't it? What was it? Uh, a plus x upon a to the n. So a plus x upon a to the power of n. Okay, well, the third term, what's that going to be? 
or we have NC0, NC1, NC2. So that's going to be the, um, the third term. And then we're going to get here A to the power of uh, N minus 2 and X upon A to the power of 2. So that's going to be our third term. So why don't we simplify that? NC2 is N factorial over 2 factorial times by N minus 2 factorial. Okay, that's using the uh, the formula for NCR, which is on the front of your exam. And we're going to get here A to the power of N minus 2 times by X squared over A squared. And I think we can further simplify this. Um, N factorial over N minus 2 factorial is N bracket N minus 1 um, over 2 factorial. And a to the power of n minus 2 divided by a to the power of 2 is going to be a to the power of n minus 2 minus 2, because we're going to be subtracting the powers. Now, for those of you who weren't sure about how I've got this, let me just um, get you to think about it for a second. Um, if I've got 5 factorial and I divide it by 4 factorial, then uh, what do I have? Well, 5 factorial is 5 times by 4 times by 3 times by 2 times by 1. 4 factorial is 4 times by 3 times by 2 times by 1. And so if I was to cancel off everything, right, if I was to cancel off, if the 4s cancel off, 3s cancel off, 2s cancel off, 1 cancels off, I'm left with 5. So 5 factorial over 4 factorial is just 5. In the same way, if I was to do 10 factorial over 9 factorial, I would get just 10. Well, let's expand the idea. Let's say I was to do 5 factorial over 3 factorial. Um, then how's that going to change it? Well, on the top, I still get 5 times by 4 times by 3 times by 2 times by 1. And on the bottom, I'm going to get 3 times by 2 times by 1. So if I cancel off, what am I going to be left with? I'm going to be left with 5 times by 4. So let's now try to um, expand this idea uh, to include the, the n's. So if I've got n factorial, right, if I've got n factorial, and I divide it by n minus 2 factorial. What does this represent? n factorial is n times by n minus 1 times by n minus 2 times by n minus 3 dot 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 until we get to times by 4 times by 3 times by 2 times by 1. What's n minus 2 factorial? It's n minus 2 times by n minus 3 times by n minus 4 times by dot 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 until we get 4 times by 3 times by 2 times by 1. So if I was then to cancel off everything, all of those terms cancel, right? All of the terms in the middle cancel, and the n minus 3 is going to cancel, what am, uh, and uh, the n minus 2 is going to cancel. And what am I going to be left with? I'm just going to be left with these two terms here, n times by n minus 1. Okay, so that's, that's how we got that part there. Okay, so let me just uh, get rid of that now. Okay, so, so this guy here, if I was to, to further simplify it, what we're saying is I have got um, a half n times by n minus 1 times by a to the power of n minus 4 times by x squared. Now we are told that the coefficient of x squared, the third term, is uh, 1056 b squared. So that's what I'm going to write now. So I have got uh, 1000 and 56 b squared is equal to a half n times by n minus 1 times by a to the power of n minus 4. And it's probably useful at this point to go back and think about the other expressions that we got. So earlier we had that um, b to the 4 is equal to a to the power of n. So I think I'll probably write that down as well. Um, b to the 4 is equal to a to the power of n. So I'm going to label these, these two guys, I think. I'm going to call that equation 1. I'm going to call that equation 2. And uh, if I was to take equation 2, I could actually get an expression for b squared, couldn't I? Because um, it would be helpful to substitute that into here. So if I was to do that, if I was to um, square root both sides, basically, I get b squared is equal to a to the power of n upon 2. Right? If you're not sure what I've done there, effectively what I've done is I've put both sides to the power of a half. Okay, so if I do that, b to the 4 times by a half, or the, sorry, 4 to, times by a half is going to be b squared, and n times a half is going to be n um, uh, upon 2.
Now, what I can do is I can then substitute this into equation one. So I'm going to substitute into equation one. And if I do that, I'm going to get um, 1056 b squared, which is a to the power of n upon two, is equal to a half uh, n times by n minus one uh, times by a to the power of n minus four. And then um, I am going to divide both sides by uh, n upon two. So I get, um, and I might as well times both sides by two, I think, right? So that'd be 2,112 uh, is equal to n bracket n minus one, a to the power of n minus four over a to the power of n upon two. And uh, again, uh, when we've when we've got um, this thing here on the right-hand side, right, if we've got a to the power of x divided by a to the power of y, then we subtract the powers, we get a to the power of x minus y. So what I can do is I can actually replace this thing with um, a to the power of n minus 4 minus n upon 2. And if I do that, I get n bracket n minus 1, a to the power of n upon 2 minus 4, and hopefully what you should recognize is that this thing here is um, kind of the answer to part A, right? So part A asked us to show that um, A to the power of n upon 2 minus 4 is equal to 48 upon n all squared. Okay, so I'm just going to go down to here. Oh dear, I've run out of space on my board and that's kind of annoying. Better go to the right. So um, if I just carry on, let's draw a line. Uh, 2112 is equal to n bracket n minus 1 uh, times by uh, 48 upon n all squared, I think. Was that right? Let's go back up. Yeah, 48 upon n all squared. And um, uh, this I can uh, multiply uh, both sides by n squared, right? So I'm going to get 2, 1, 1, 2, n squared, right? So what I'm saying is I take that n, it's going to be squared. I'll bring it across the left hand side, is equal to uh, n squared minus n times by uh, 48 squared. And so this is going to be uh, 2, 1, 1, 2, n squared is equal to. 48 squared n squared just do that what is 48 squared 48 times by 48 is 2304 so 2304 n squared minus 2304 n okay and uh, i will uh, subtract the 2112 from both sides so minus 2112 n squared so that's 192. So zero is equal to 192 n squared minus 2304 n. I can then factorize out an n. So I get n bracket 192 n minus 2304. And so therefore either n is equal to zero, which is a, a trivial solution. We're not interested in that. Or n is equal to 2304 divided by 192. So let me just do that on my calculator. 2, uh, two 3, 0, 4 uh, divided by 192, which is 12. So I get n there is equal to 12. Well, okay, then my I, I'm required to find a and b then, aren't I? Right. So um, ba, 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 ba. what's the easiest way to do that? Um, use use this guy here, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna substitute into the answer for part A. Sorry that my writing's a bit of a mess because I unfortunately my board is kind of cut off. So that's kind of annoying. Uh, when n is equal to 12, we substitute in, we're going to get 48 upon 12 to the power of 2 is equal to a. Um, 12 divided by 2 is 6 minus 4. So uh, 48 divided by 12 is 4. So 4 squared is equal to a to the power of 2. And so a is just going to be equal to 4 there. Um, you could say, by the way, uh, a squared is equal to 16, and then if you square root it, you should get plus or minus 4, but we're told in the question that a and b um, are both positive. Okay, so that, that's that's that reason in case anyone's wondering about that, right? So um, uh, we were told, where were we told that? We were told that 
n, a, and b are positive integers here. Okay, so the last thing we've got to do is we've got to find out what b is. Where's the easiest place for me to substitute in? Probably into this guy here or this guy. So b to the 4 is equal to a to the n. All right, so uh, b to the 4 is equal to a to the power of n. So here we've got uh, 4 to the power of 12. And so therefore b is going to be equal to um, 4 to the power of 12 to the power of a quarter, which is 4 to the power of 3. Okay, and 4 to the power of 3 is 64. Okay, so I think that's very difficult. The algebra there is quite hard, um, but those are our answers. Um, yeah, so you have my sympathy, guys. I think that's, that's quite difficult. But with a bit of patience, um, just push through. And I think as well, you hopefully can see that you are trying to use the answer to part A in your uh, question for part B. Okay. Okay, here we are in question 11. A cylinder which is open at both ends has a base radius of r and a height of 4r. Its curved surface area is s squared. Given that r varies with time, find s at the instant when ds dt is equal to 6 times by dr dt. Well, the first thing I've done is I've drawn a, a diagram because I think it helps. We need to find an expression for the surface area. We don't need the area of the top circle or the bottom circle because the cylinder is open at both ends. So we need an expression for the area of this bit in uh, around the uh, side. So to do that, we need the circumference of the circle on the bottom, which is uh, 2 pi r, and we want to times it by the height, which is 4 r. So s is equal to 2 pi r times by 4 r, and that's going to give us 8 pi r squared. That's the first thing. Second thing is um, ds dt, the rate of change at s with respect to time, is going to be connected to dr dt, the rate of change at r with respect to time, and the way it's going to be connected is through ds dr. Now, if you're not sure about that, the way you want to think about this is um, uh, basically like the guys on the right-hand side of fractions. Now, they're not really fractions, um, but it's convenient for us to think that way. Why? Well, because if you imagine multiplying those fractions out, what would happen is the drs are going to cancel, and you're going to be left with ds dt. Okay, so that's what's going on there. It's what's called a connected rate of change problem, right? The rate of change of R with respect to time is connected to the rate of change of the surface area with respect to time through this thing here. Now, if we compare this whole expression with this guy here, then what you can see is that the dsdr term must be 6. Okay, so if I was just to highlight that, basically what we're saying is that guy there, the dsdr, is the same thing as 6. Okay? So ideally, what we want to do is we want to find an expression for ds dr. How are we going to do that? Well, we've got to differentiate s. So ds dr, let's just do that. ds dr is equal to 16 pi r. So we've just differentiated s. And now what we're going to do is we're going to set it equal to 6. So 6 is equal to 16 pi r, which means that r is going to equal to uh, 6 divided by 16 pi or if you prefer, um, 3 over 8 pi, okay? And uh, what we want to do is we want to find an expression for s at that time. So we've just got to substitute into our expression for s. So s is then going to be equal to 8 pi times by r squared, so times by 3 upon 8 pi all squared. Um, well, uh, we can think of that as 8 pi times by 3 squared, which is 9, uh, divided by 8 pi squared, right? So 8 pi all squared. And uh, 1 to 8 pi is going to cancel off on top and bottom. So that goes, that goes. And so what we're left with is 9 divided by 8 pi. Okay, so 9 divided by 8 pi. All right. And... Um, we probably need to use a calculator to find out what that is. I don't have a calculator on me at the moment. Really sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> probably should have brought one. Let me just use my phone calculator. Oh, come on. Uh, so 8 times by 3.14159, I guess, is equal to 25.13. And I'm going to do 9 divided by whatever that was, divided by that and I get 0 0.358, okay? So that is equal to 0 0.358.
Okay, right. I hope that was helpful, guys. And uh, I wish you all the best with your exams um, when they come in May.